Hi, good day. This will be your discussion on sudden cardiac arrest. So when we say sudden cardiac death, it is an unexpected death occurring within one hour of the onset of cardiovascular symptoms. So that's why it's referred to as sudden because it occurs within one hour of your cardiovascular symptoms. Now, causes. So the most common arrhythmia that leads to your sudden cardiac death is your ventricular fibrillation. It could also be caused by sustained severe bradyarrhythmias. So when we say bradyarrhythmias, example of that is your bradycardia. It could be because of a systole or cardiac standstill and then your pulseless electrical activity. Now, cardiac causes. It could be caused by your coronary heart disease, okay, which is uh, leading to towards the blockage of your uh, coronary artery, hence leading towards decrease of oxygenation, reperfusion following ischemia, then myocardial hypertrophy. Okay, myocardial hypertrophy would lead to the enlargement of your ventricles, which would lead to heart failure. And then you have cardiomyopathy and inflammatory myocardial disorders. So cardiomyopathy, cardio means cardiac, myo means muscle. So your problem in cardiomyopathy is that your heart muscles become thick and rigid. Because of the thickening and the rigidity of your heart muscles, the pumping action of which becomes ineffective. So there are several types of cardiomyopathy. You have dilated cardiomyopathy, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and restrictive cardiomyopathy. So all of this leads towards the weakening of your cardiac muscles. Then for your inflammatory myocardial disorders, you have disorders such as your endocarditis and myocarditis. This infection leads to also poor uh, pumping action of your heart. Then you have valve disorders. For the valve disorders, one example is your mitral valve prolapse. Then you have primary electrical disorders, which are your dysrhythmias. Then dissecting or ruptured aneurysm. So you know out aneurysm is an outpouching in your blood vessel. Whenever you have aneurysm, there is a high risk for rupture. The risk for rupture is usually increased if your patient is having hypertension. Then you have cardiac drug toxicity. Example of the cardiac drug which is commonly having toxicity is your digoxin. Then non-cardiac causes. One is your pulmonary embolism. In pulmonary embolism, there is a block okay, or there is an emboli that travel towards your pulmonary artery, hence blocking your pulmonary circulation. Then cerebral hemorrhage. When I talk about cerebral hemorrhage, we're talking about hemorrhagic stroke. So there is severe bleeding in the brain. Take note that even your cardiac system is a vital system. It is still dependent to the functioning of your brain. Autonomic dysfunction. When I say autonomic dysfunction, this talks about your sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. So whenever there is a balance, imbalance I mean, between your sympathetic and parasympathetic system, it might lead also to your sudden cardiac death. Choking because of a sudden increase or decrease, I mean, in oxygen supply, okay, it could lead also to your cardiac arrest. And then electrical shock, which leads to ventricular fibrillation, leading to sudden cardiac arrest. Clinical manifestations. The clinical manifestations will initially be like your acute coronary syndrome and myocardial infarction. So your patient would have severe chest pain, dyspnea, okay, or orthopnea, and then palpitations or lightheadedness. The palpitations is caused by the incompensation of your heart, attempt to compensate, and then your lightheadedness is already caused by poor cerebral tissue. Complete loss of consciousness and death may occur within minutes. However, if your patient had a ventricular tachycardia prior to cardiac arrest, the consciousness and ventation may be impaired prior to collapse and loss of consciousness. Okay, so because in VTAC, take note, your patient may still have a pulse. Because of that, you can only have impairment of consciousness prior to loss of consciousness. Then, the goal of care for our patients who had sudden cardiac arrest is to restore cardiac output and tissue perfusion. Okay, the goal, again, is to restore cardiac output and tissue perfusion. How can we do that? Treatment. We need to employ your basic life support and then your advanced cardiac life support within two to four minutes of cardiac arrest. The use of automated external defibrillator is strongly recommended, especially in the outpatient settings. Okay, in the inpatient settings, we need to use your defibrillator. Then, of course, your cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Okay, the guidelines that we follow is prescribed by your American Heart Association. In the Philippine setting, the counterpart of which is your Philippine Heart Association. Internationally, you have your International League okay, of Committee on Resuscitation. 
or sorry, that should be International Liaison Committee on Resuscitation. So, nursing diagnosis. The common nursing diagnosis for this uh, patient is ineffective tissue perfusion, okay, cerebral tissue perfusion related to ineffective cardiac output, impaired spontaneous ventilation related to cardiac arrest, spiritual distress related to unexplained sudden cardiac death, and then you have your distress okay, or disturbed thought process related to compromised cerebral circulation, and then you can have your fear related to risk of future episodes of sudden cardiac arrest. Emergency cardiac care would include the following guidelines. First, to treat the person and then the cardiac monitor. This means that whenever there are problems among our patients or whenever there are abnormalities detected on the cardiac monitor, we should check our patient and assess further our patient before we proceed with um, treating the dysrhythmias. So the first thing that you might do upon detecting a dysrhythmia is to check the pulse of your patient because the dysrhythmia could be possibly shown if ever the cardiac monitor is not properly attached to your patient. Then, activate the emergency medical services or system. In the hospital, you might have your code. Take note that you should not be doing your cardiac life support or basic life support alone. You need an assistance from the healthcare team. Hence, you need to activate your code. Then, begin and continue basic cardiac life support principles throughout the resuscitation effort. So, recall that the chest compression should be at least 2 inches in depth. And then, the ratio for adults is at 30 is 2. two. You administer 30 compressions when you are giving 2 breaths. Then, continually assess the effectiveness of emergency interventions. This means that every 2 minutes or every 5 cycles of your CPR, you should check for the presence of pulse of your patient. Whenever the defibrillator is available, so you need to defibrillate, especially if it is a VFib and VTAC. Okay, remember VFib and pulseless VTAC should be defibrillated ASAP. And then initiate ACLS protocols early if within scope of practices. Now, so in the management of your patient with cardiac arrest, we are using the BLS or basic life support algorithm. So this is the basic life support algorithm. Whenever somebody is unresponsive without normal respiration, you need to get you need to call emergency services and then get an AED. Okay, you need someone to get an AED and then you assess for pulse within 5 to 10 seconds. Once there is no presence of pulse, okay, you need to do your start cycles of 30 is to 2 breathing. So 30 compressions is to 2 breaths. Then you give your AED once the AED arrives, you need the AED will be the one to determine if the rhythm is shockable or not. You just need to attach the AED properly to your patient's chest. Okay, if it is shockable, you need to administer one shock and immediately resume your CPR. If it is not shockable, by the time that the AED would say it's not shockable, immediately resume your CPR and then assess the rhythm every two minutes and continuously repeat the steps until you'll be able to do your ACLS or the ACLS providers has arrived. Also for your basic life support, if the patient is not breathing, however the patient has pulse, you can administer breathing for five to six seconds and then just assess pulse every two minutes. Okay, so the criteria for high quality CPR would include the starting of the compressions, hard and fast within 10 seconds of the recognition of arrest, allow for complete chest recoil between compressions. If you can recall chest recoil, this allows your heart or your chest to return to its normal state before you do your compressions. The advantage of this is to allow for ventricular feeling. And then minimize interruptions between chest compressions. So it is advisable for you to shift between compressors when you are checking the rhythm of the patient such that you need to minimize the interruptions and then assure that the breaths make the chest rise because if the breathing does not make the chest rise it will not be beneficial to your patient and then do not overventilate your patient assess for shockable rhythm as, as soon as your aed arrives in a witness cardiac arrest it is most likely that the rhythm is shockable because in a witness cardiac arrest the tendency is that the rhythm is ventricular fibrillation now, let's go to your ACLS. Your ACLS is the Advanced Cardiac Life Support. We commonly apply this in paramedic settings and we also apply this in hospital settings. So once you have recognized arrest or applied CPR, you need to start your CPR right away. 
okay, while somebody is doing the CPR, somebody is attaching the patient to oxygen therapy and then attaching the patient to the monitor and defibrillator. So these efforts in the first box here, it tends to be simultaneous. Then if the rhythm is shockable, which will be determined by your, uh, by your cardiac monitor, if the rhythm is shockable, you need to uh, deliver your shock. Take note that there are only two shockable rhythms. You have your ventricular fibrillation and then your pulseless VTAC. Once shock is administered, you need to do your CPR for two minutes. And then you need to ensure the presence of your intravenous or intraosseous access. Okay, once access is there, once CPR is done for two minutes, so two minutes is about five cycles of CPR, five cycles of 30 is to two, you need to determine again if the rhythm is shockable or not. If shockable, you need to do your shock, of course, and then after the shock, you need to do your immediate CPR. Okay, so again, once shockable, you administer your shock and then immediate CPR. You can start your epinephrine right away once available, and the epinephrine is given every three to five minutes. Then, if the rhythm is still shockable, you administer your shock, and then you give your amiodarone to your patient. Now, if the rhythm is not shockable, the story changes. Take note, since it is not shockable, you are not supposed to administer your shock. So there is no shock administered if the rhythm is non shockable. Examples of non shockable rhythms are your asystole and your pulseless electrical activity. So when we say asystole again, that's a flat line. When we say pulseless electrical activity, there is presence of some arrhythmias. However, your patient is not having a pulse. Okay, it could be a normal sinus rhythm, it could be another dysrhythmia, but then your patient is not having a pulse. Then you continuously do your CPR. And through IV or intraosseous access, you should be giving your epinephrine every three to five minutes. Your capnography, by the way, is used to evaluate the effectiveness of advanced airway. So it will be able to detect carbon dioxide levels. If the rhythm becomes shockable, you proceed to the previous steps that we have discussed, wherein you need to administer shock to your patient and then immediately do CPR. But if your patient's rhythm is still not shockable, you do your CPR and then treat reversible causes. So, what do we mean by reversible causes? So there are five H's and five T's for the reversible causes of your dysrhythmias. Okay, or five, uh, ten reversible causes of your sudden cardiac arrest. So this includes hypovolemia, hypoxia, hydrogen ion problems, commonly it's acidosis, potassium problems, hypothermia, then you have your tension pneumothorax, your cardiac tamponade, your toxins, and then your pulmonary thrombosis and coronary thrombosis. These are the 10 most common causes of your sudden cardiac arrest. One cause that is not included here is your hypoglycemia. So one thing that you need to assess among patients who have arrested, once you have ruled out the primary causes of our hypoglycemia. So if patient is hypoglycemic, you need to administer D50 water to correct the hypoglycemic episodes of the patient. Okay, so when we say our goal is ROSC or ROSC, Okay, when I say ROSC, it is the return of spontaneous circulation. So in this one, you need to monitor the pulse and the blood pressure. And then spontaneous arterial pressure waves with intra-arterial monitoring is usually recommended. So this is the post-cardiac uh, post arrest care for your patient. Thank you very much for your attention. The outline of this PowerPoint presentation was adapted from the presentation of Professor Robiana Gesto. If there are any concerns regarding this presentation, it may be emailed to the email address indicated on the PowerPoint presentation.